everyone. I'm Gary Nolan. I'd like to welcome you to the Progressive Commentary Hour. Today, a special broadcast on the conditions at Fukushima and its present and long-term threats. My panel includes Arne Gunderson. He is the founding chief engineer of Fairwinds Energy Education, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating the public about nuclear power and other energy issues. In the past, he was an energy advisor for 39 years of nuclear power engineering experience and a former nuclear industry senior vice president. During his industry career, he managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country. Now, an independent nuclear engineer and safety expert, Arnie has provided testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety, and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the U.S., Canada, and internationally. In 2008, he was appointed by the Vermont Senate President to be the first chair of the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant Oversight Panel. He is regarded as one of the leading nuclear experts who is conveying the truth about the dangers of the Fukushima Daiichi plant and the global threats from the ongoing release of radiation. His website is fairwinds.org. From Sydney, Australia, we're with Dr. Helen Caldicott. She is perhaps the single most articulate and passionate advocate of citizen action to counter the nuclear and environmental crisis. She has a medical degree from the University of Adelaide and was a pediatric instructor at Harvard Medical School until 1980 when she resigned to work full-time on the prevention of nuclear war. She co-founded the Physicians for Social Responsibility, an organization of 23,000 doctors committed to educating their colleagues about the dangers of nuclear power and nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Dr. Caldicott has received numerous awards, was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by Linus Pauling, and has 21 honorary degrees. The Smithsonian has named Dr. Caldicott as one of the most influential women of the 20th century. She's written a lot of articles and books, her latest being Nuclear Power is Not the Answer to Global Warming or Anything Else. Her website is Helen caldicott.com that's c-a-l-d-i-c-o-t-t and we're also joined by professor harvey wasserman harvey wasserman is a professor of history at columbus state college and capital university in ohio he is an investigative journalist author and has been a national voice in the anti-war and anti-nuclear movements for over 40 years he is also a senior advisor for Greenpeace USA and the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. And uh, he is also the founder of Solartopia.org, a grassroots endeavor to promote a green-powered Earth. Among his many books are George W. Ber Bush vs. the Superpower of Peace, and his articles frequently appear in Counterpunch, Alternet, Nuke Watch, Huffington Post. He can also be heard every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern Time as host of Green Power and Wellness on the Progressive Radio Network. His website is solartopia.org. I'd like to welcome you all to our program. Well, thank you, Gary. It's Arnie here. Thank you. Uh, as, Gary, it's great to be with you. Good. As all of you know, the format is that I'll do an extended introduction, but then allow each of you the opportunity to really lay out your arguments without being interrupted. And then at the completion of each person, uh, the next person will have a chance, if they feel anything should be added, to add something in. But I have special questions for each of you. I'm going to begin with you, Arnie. We have been witnessing the efforts to contain radiation at the Fukushima reactor site, worsening and and higher levels of radioactivity released being reported. In fact, in July, there was a report of cesium levels spiking 9,000% in just three days, and the cause was reported as unknown. This past October, there was a burst in the radiated, radi radioactive water storage tanks, 
That was followed by a report that radiation levels soared 6,700 times the legal limit. And by the end of October, water radiation had doubled, and early November, a report of over 800 tons of radioactive material pouring into the Pacific Ocean. The Japanese energy company TEPCO made the decision to start to remove the fuel rods. At the end of November, it had appeared that TEPCO and the uh, Japanese government had thrown up their hands, and the news was reporting that they had decided just to dump all the nuclear waste right into the ocean. And finally, all the bad news on the ground at Fukushima was followed by reports of mass dispersion of radioactive waste reaching the coastline of other nations, the Arctic, Canadi the Canadian coast, the American coast, and beyond. And parallel to all this, there has been reports of adverse health effects as a result of expanding radioactive contamination. So, Arnie, as the nuclear engineer on our panel, share with us what you know for certain is happening on the ground at Fukushima and tell us what the greatest risk and danger is at this moment as Japan makes efforts to stabilize the situation. Then second, before we discuss possible solutions, estimate for us whether the efforts being made are satisfactory or appropriate, and if not, why. The form is yours. Well, well, thank you for having me, and, and hi to Helen and Harvey. Um, the, um, the the problems at Fukushima uh, are not resolved, and, and actually uh, began after the accident because no one in Japan really spent enough money to attack the problem early on with the ferocity that it needed. Um, so the the problem goes back to Tokyo Electric being. Um, incapable of, of, of solving this problem. They're, they're not an engineering company. But, but worse than that, it's that they never had enough money to, uh, to do it right. And the, the Japanese government underfunded the effort all the way along, blaming Tokyo Electric and trying to claim that there was more than enough money there to solve the problem. So we have a, an incompetent company that was underfunded uh, placed in charge of the, the worst um, uh, industrial accident in the history of the world. So the, the die was cast in April or May of 2011. N now we've got a site that uh, um, it is still um, uh, just on the edge every day of being out of control. The, the, the tank farm, which is uh, storing a thousand tankfuls, each tank weighs uh, about 100,000 uh, tons of water um, is not seismically qualified, and we're one earthquake away from having uh, you know that tank farm collapse and leak into the Pacific Ocean. Um, of course, the plant itself is already leaking into the Pacific Ocean with no end in sight. Tokyo Electric has suggested that they build an ice dam around the power plant, something that's never been done before. Uh, and, and something that's going to be done in 2015. So for at least two or three more years, we're going to have water leaking out of the plant. Um, that the, the last piece is that these buildings are, have been uh, compromised by the earthquake and destroyed by explosions. So the, uh, the net effect is, again, we're one earthquake away from having a, a building collapse, put us right back to where we were, um, on, on March 11th, 2011, when uh, when this accident started, um, the, the the problem begins and ends with the Japanese government's assumption of responsibility, and I don't think they really want to assume that responsibility because they'd have to admit to their uh, population just uh, how expensive it will be. It'll be a half a trillion dollars, and when you're trying to start up 50 other nuclear plants. The last thing you want to do is have your population know uh, how costly the accident was. As a follow-up, based upon the information you, re uh, you are receiving and reviewing, is there anything you'd like to add to the idea that the rest of the island is severely contaminated in different places, yet the people of Japan have been led to believe that it's not? You have 39 people living around the most congested area in the world, Tokyo. 
What are the plans if things get really bad? Now, the people in Japan received an extraordinarily high uh, radiation exposure and continue to receive that exposure every day. Um, there's um, several sources of it initially, and that includes a huge noble gas cloud that covered most of northern Japan and was detected as far away as Vancouver. Now, after that, of course, there was iodine. That was um, improperly um, uh, protected against. The Japanese knew there was an iodine release and didn't give the protective pills to their population. They were more concerned about a public relations problem than protecting the health and safety of their population. And the last piece is the um, hot particles. Um, Japan, northern Japan, is, is loaded with hot particles. If it were a nuclear power plant, it would be called an RCA, a radiologically contaminated area. The, um, I was in Tokyo last year, and I took five samples in Tokyo over five days. I brought them back to the lab, and each of those samples would qualify as radioactive waste and have to be stored in, in a disposal facility in Texas if it were in the United States. But yet, the Japanese are just living with it. Just recently, a particle was found 400 kilometers, 250 miles away from the Daiichi site, and the activity in that particle was the equivalent. If it were, it's a very small particle, but if it were a pound, um, that's how the activity is measured usually, it would be 40 billion gamma rays per second coming out of that one pound of material. Now, thankfully, this piece is much smaller, but it's the size that could get lodged in a, in a person's lung. So we've got hot particles that were absorbed by people's lungs. None of these things that I just talked to you about, Gary, have been included in the IAEA's dose calculation for the population. I appreciate those insights to start us off. Uh, Dr. Uh, Helen Cullicott, um what is the Japanese government doing now to prepare for the worst if it should happen in order to protect the Japanese population? And then speak about the now unstoppable flow of radioactive material into the ocean and what can you say about its current course due to Pacific climate and current conditions? Where is that radiation most headed? Well, <coughs> To my knowledge, the Japanese government is, is really doing nothing to alleviate the situation. And as Ami said, they're into saving money. And so is TEPCO. And it seems that TEPCO wants to make sure that its shareholders get decent dividends. And so they're trying to save money on this whole catastrophe um, <clears throat> as it proceeds. And so... Um, the whole situation is in the hands of incompetent people. In fact, TEPCO has um, uh, given the Japanese mafia uh, permission to bring in workers subcontracted to the Japanese mafia and other firms. And the workers they're bringing in now are, are homeless people from the streets in Tokyo, some mentally sick people, um, and they're running out of warm bodies, in fact, to supervise and run the whole thing as workers um, because people who work there are getting high doses of radiation and then they have to be discharged. And people don't want to go and work there, A, because they might be subject to getting cancer later in life, B, that they know they're not being adequately protected, and C, because they're their testicles get irradiated and that could impact upon their children and future generations from a genetic point of view to increase the incidence of genetic disease and I think many Japanese people are aware of this. So, and, and the situation is going to go on for at least the, the next 50 years or so, say, 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 so says the IAEA and other organisations how are they going to manage it when there are no people to look after it? Um, and the um, water that's flowing to the Pacific, up to 400 tonnes a day of very radioactive water, there's no end in sight to that. 
Um, and the radiation plumes are expected to hit the west coast of America, um, particularly the north part, in March next year. And then uh, California will receive a large amount of radiation uh, towards the end of the year. But as Arnie Gunderson says, this is not the beginning. This is, a bit, I mean, this is not the end. It's the beginning because water will be flowing at that rate or maybe more for the next 50 years if nothing can be done. And from my perspective, from what I've read and talked to Arnie and others about it, there seems to be no way to alleviate the situation as there are three molten cores that have melted their way onto a cracked containment floor or into the earth and huge amounts of water pouring down from the mountains behind the reactor over those cores um, becoming severely contaminated with radioactive water and then flowing out into the Pacific or being pumped out at the moment into these very fragile tanks that Arnie Gunderson talked about. So the situation is really quite extraordinary. And the other perspective to note is that, oh, people say, well, don't worry, because the radiation in the ocean will be diluted. But the solution to pollution by dilution is salacious when it comes to radiation because c 137 radioactive iodine-129, that has a half-life of 17 million years, um, technetium, uh, uh, tritium, brontium, all sorts of isotopes. So there are up to 100 different isotopes. Bioconcentrate in the food chain, for instance, the algae suck up the contaminants, concentrating it, you know, 10 to 100 times above the background water level. Crustaceans then eat, eat the algae and they concentrate, so the little fish eat the crustaceans, big fish eat the little fish, and we stand at the apex of the food chain. And so these, um, these isotopes concentrate most highly in different organs in our body, thyroid, brain, bone, uh, bone marrow, liver, and the like. So there's a, a lot to learn about this from an a biological perspective, an engineering perspective, a chemical perspective, and it's, it's quite complex, but not too difficult to, to understand. I appreciate those insights. The other thing to note is that to, if you eat radioactive food, fish, miso, seaweed from Japan or rice or, or the like that's being imported freely into America at the moment, it takes from oh, five to eight years to develop your cancer because incubation time after being exposed to radioactive material is, um, is that time, five to eight years. It's called the latent period of carcinogenesis. Whereas if I sneezed on you, within two days you'd be developing a cold and sneezing as well. And that's the ace up the sleeve of the nuclear industry, this long, long latent period and when the cancer arises in your breast or your bone or whatever, it doesn't wear a flag saying, I was made by conceiving and you ate in a piece of fish 20 years ago that came from Japan. When we look at the several documentaries that have been produced about Fukushima, uh, you notice how many people are still living in a relatively close proximity and that they only insisted upon evacuation uh, for people within so many kilometers. However, you're looking at farmers who show the effect on their soil, on their cattle, chickens, on their own health. Explain to us, if you would please, what happens when this radiation is continuing to come out every second of the day? How far does it go? Uh, what type of likely outcome is there going to be for these people? And what law of physics has been written that says that a wind stops blowing radiation because someone puts up some barrier that says, oh, this is safe beyond 10 miles or 50 miles or 100 miles. M mind you, under 200 miles, you're in Tokyo. How long does it take the wind traveling 12 miles an hour, the average wind, uh, to get to that radiation in that area? And then then, as you mentioned, it might take decades before that cancer manifests, depending upon a person's vulnerability and, and, uh, and how much they've been exposed to, but they're getting that every single day. Could you give us what it would be like to be there and what we're not being told by our own government 
and the Japanese are certainly not telling their own people. Well, up to 20 million people are living in uh, highly radioactive areas at the moment, including children, and children are 10 to 20 times more sensitive to radiation than adults. Little girls are twice as sensitive as little boys. Women are more sensitive than men. Fetuses are thousands of times more so and can be damaged by radiation. Children are kept inside now. Um, they wear masks. Their playgrounds can be very radioactive. They are becoming obese because they're not getting any exercise. However, the dust from outside will be tramped in on their feet and, and uh, the buildings inside will, will become radioactive um, from, the, from the outside air. People are being exposed in several ways. One, uh, their food. And the Fukushima farmers have been encouraged to start to regrow food. In fact, government officials the other day openly in front of the journalists started eating radioactive rice from Fukushima just to show it was okay. I mean, really stupid people who don't understand the medical effects of radiation. So the children and the parents are eating radioactive food. Uh, the isotopes will go to different organs, as I said, thyroid, bowel, liver, uh, um, brain, etc., and later cause cancer. They're being exposed to from ground shine, which means that the radioactive elements like cesium and other elements on the ground emit um, very high levels of gamma radiation, which is the only thing really being measured by the Japanese government. So they're being exposed to external radiation from that. Also, if there are more, or if there are more releases from the reactors, um, they are exposed by being engulfed in clouds of radioactive elements and then inhaling them or swallowing them or, or the gamma radiation impacting them externally. So you've got external radiation, internal radiation. Um, and as Rani said, areas in Tokyo are extremely radioactive. So, uh, and, and nothing is being done to protect the people. In fact, the Russians were much more proactive than the Japanese and evacuated people pretty fast from high radiation areas. But because the Japanese culture is such that they're, they're sort of pro-nuclear, number one, and they want to keep the nuclear power plant running. And because the population is so very dense and there's nowhere really to move people, although they could if they really desired, They've left the people in situ to be exposed. And so I think we have to extrapolate from what happened at Chernobyl. An excellent report by the New York Academy of Sciences uh, estimated that um, by now over a million people have died as a result of the radiation um, emitted from Chernobyl. And if you extrapolate that now to Japan, where Arnie says three times more noble gases were released from Fukushima than at Chernobyl and probably much more cesium and, and therefore other isotopes. And with a very densely populated area, you could extrapolate and say, you know, it's possible that over time more than a million people will die as a result of this ghastly accident. But it's not just this generation, you see because the land will remain and the food will remain radioactive for hundreds of years. So it's ongoing damage to this and future generations, really, for the rest of time. The one more Nuclear thought, accidents never end. One more uh, comment, if you would, please. We have done an analysis of the water tables, the aquifers, particularly the aquifer that is right underneath the area where Fukushima is, and a high probability that the radiation, a certain amount of it is going to get into the aquifer. And once an aquifer is polluted, there's no mechanism on Earth to depollute it of radioactivity, and that feeds a lot of the rice-growing area. And when we spoke with the, like the Ralph Nader of Japan, uh, this woman, about what's being done, and she said, nothing. Uh, and I said, but doesn't it make sense that since radiation is going to be in the water on the island and that water is being used to irrigate food crops and the people are going to be eating that food crops, they're going to be getting radiation from the food and the water 
and uh, and the combination of these two over a period of time are going to be devastating. And her answer was interesting. She said, what do you think they could do? Where can they put over 100 million people? There's no place to put people. They have no way of getting them anywhere. Maybe they can make a deal with China to take over China's phantom cities, where China built some 60 cities that could hold over 64 million people. Um, that might be possible. Maybe they could make a deal with Russia uh, and, and over some of the islands that they uh, had before the end of World War II. There are things that could be done, but no one's talking about it because people in, in Japan right now are afraid that it may be a worst-case scenario. So they're simply going about their life denying this. And I said, well, that's a very dangerous form of um, a denial. And she said, yes. She said, but what are we going to do? What, what are your thoughts about at, at what point does Japan simply become uninhabitable? where there's so much radiation over such a long period of time that you start seeing the most vulnerable that you just discussed adversely affected, the older generation, they had one of the largest older generations in the world now, and their immune systems are not vital, and so we could be seeing millions upon millions of people die, uh, just as a million people died from Chernobyl. Your thoughts, please. Well, the thing is that cancer is pretty common, particularly in old people. In, in fact, cancer is kind of a disease of old age. The longer you live, the more likely you are to get a cancer. So it's common in a population. And so, to notice an increased incidence of cancer is a little bit difficult, although we're seeing it now amongst the children. Um, we're looking at the children in Fukushima under the age of 18 and found that 58 children now have been diagnosed or suspected to have thyroid cancer, 58. The normal incidence of thyroid cancer in children is one to two per million. And that's the tip of the iceberg. So we are seeing unusual cancers occurring and they will continue to occur. Other diseases too are caused by radiation exposure like cataracts of the eye, diabetes, premature aging of children, uh, severe congenital abnormalities, and there are indeed homes full of such deformed children like thalidomide babies around Chernobyl. Um, other diseases of hypothyroidism, thyroid cancer, cancers of any organ because radiation can induce cancers of any organ, and and other very debilitating diseases. So it's not just cancer, we're talking about other diseases. And these will increase over time, but the, but the Japanese government in many of the prefectures, they don't even have a cancer registry to know if the cancers are increasing. The doctors um, have been told not to tell patients that their symptoms are related to radiation. I spoke to uh, huge crowds of people twice in Japan recently, full of mothers, who are desperate to know the truth. When I told them the awful things that could occur, they were, they were so pleased to be told the truth because no one really is telling them the truth. So in the, they're in the most desperate situation. And what, what would I propose to do? I mean, I don't know. You, you that raise a very valid point. Where do you move 100 million people or 30 million people from Tokyo or the like? Where do, you, where do they go on this tiny little island? The situation seems to me irredeemable. And this is really what nuclear, the nuclear age is about, not just nuclear power, nuclear weapons, nuclear waste, the whole goddamn thing. If I may use that word, I'm an Australian, so I can say that. Um, it's just, it's absolutely impossible to try and work out what to do. And as Army nuclear engineer says, he, he really has no solutions. But from a societal point of view, first they have to recognise the dangers. They have to admit it. They have to do the research, the analysis, see what's actually happening to people on the ground medically, which they're not doing. And then they have to get a committee together and decide what to do about it. The United Nations should be involved. The whole world should be involved, especially if there's another huge release of radiation and much of the Northern Hemisphere becomes 
becomes contaminated. I appreciate those insights. Public health problems. We'll be coming back uh, for some additional questions. That is Dr. Helen Caldicott from Sydney, Australia. Now we'll go over and say hello to Harvey Wasserman. How, how are you today, Harvey? Great, Gary. How are you? And thank you so much for doing this show. You know, it's amazing. Uh, PRN is here doing this. Uh, no other networks, no other media is, is even beginning to talk about Fukushima at this point. So uh, we, we thank you for your powerful and courageous voice here. Thank you. I want to start by reading something that we're not getting in the United States. There was a bill that passed banning investigative journalism. I'll quote from this. Is this bill the end of democracy? These are some of the stipulations of a bill that was passed on December 6th to little fanfare in the United States. Here are four disturbing ways the bill could be a democracy muzzler. It defines terrorism as imposing one's opinions upon others. According to Article 12, terrorism is partially defined as an activity that forces, quote, political and other principles or opinions on the state or other people, end quote. In other words, throw up a rowdy anti-government protest and the judiciary can find a reason to lock you away. It criminalizes also investigative journalism. Journalists can be prosecuted for, quote, improperly accessing classified documents or, quote, conspiring to leak classified documents. Even asking an official to take a look at a classified document could constitute, quote, conspiracy leading up to five years in prison per incident. Quote, instigating the release of a government secrets, meanwhile, carries a 10 years in prison. Basically, anything can be a secret. Administrators can make the opaque decisions to classify a document even if it were uh, relates not at all to national security. That effectively allows them to hide any embarrassing piece of evidence and then pursue the journalists and bloggers who make it public. Now, this is a description of a bill that was passed, not in the United States, but in Japan. Ostensibly, its purpose is to prevent dissemination of news regarding the size and actual scope of the aftermath of Fukushima nuclear disaster that threatens the West Coast and other parts of the world. That is something the average American is unaware of. So, I just wanted to share that with our audience. So, being an investigative journalist, being an advocate for the people, being uh, an environmentalist right now in Japan, it could put you in prison for decades. Just tell yeah. them the truth. Uh, and they did this uh, a year ago. They arrested a, a Japanese professor, threw him in jail without trial or hearing for 20 days, uh, merely for uh, criticizing the Japanese policy of burning, <laughs> incinerating radioactive waste in the open atmosphere, for God's sake. So uh, this is, a Gary, a very, very disturbing development here. The Abe administration, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, very pro-nuclear, trying to reopen the 50 reactors that were thankfully shut after Fukushima um, uh, and cracking down on the kinds of information that we desperately need to have any kind of sense of what's going on at Fukushima. You know, we're deeply grateful to Arnie Gunderson and Helen Caldicott standing virtually alone, very few others. I did have on my PRN show earlier today Dr. Chris Busby, one of the very few among these uh, this small group to be willing to publicize what's happening with the health implications and the engineering challenges at Fukushima. But this uh, State Secrets Act comes exactly at the time that they have begun to bring down or to attempt to bring down the radioactive fuel rods from Unit 4 of Fukushima, where the um, the core, thankfully, was uh, emptied of radioactive fuel at that time. We had three meltdowns and explosions, as you know, in Units 1, 2, and 3. Unit 4 has had uh, a tremendous number. We're not even clear on the number of hot radioactive fuel rods suspended almost 100 feet in the air in the fuel pool that's designed by General Electric, and there are 23 uh, virtually identical reactors in the United States uh, with the same uh, uh, d crazy design. So they've begun the, the uh, task of bringing them down, these fuel rods, and, and we, we can't know what's going on. 
it's a, it's essentially it's a state secret. And as Arnie Gunderson has pointed out so uh, eloquently, uh, since the accident, uh, and a misfire at, in the bring down of these fuel rods at Unit Four could lead to a terrible catastrophe. And so we, and yet we won't, we won't know. Uh, we, in fact, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power, made a public complaint about news um, helicopters that were flying over, trying to film uh, the bring down of these fuel rods. Why should this be necessary? Why isn't? Why don't we have saturation media coverage of this going on so that at least the experts around the world who could con- con- conceivably contribute? To this uh, a desperately important uh, um, event, could at least uh, know what's going on. But as we as we said, this uh, state secrets act has now come in at precisely this moment. And I will tell you, and I've posted articles uh, uh, to this effect at nukefree.org, which I edit, n u k e f r e e dot o r g. There are state legis- there are legislators, national legislators in Japan who have used the term fascist to describe the State Secrets Act. And Asahi Shimbun, one of the largest newspapers in Japan, has compared this to the civil liberties situation in Japan prior to World War II. Uh, people are very, very concerned about the political uh, uh, leanings now that have come out since Fukushima. Of course, there's a, a military, uh, semi-military conflict going on with China. And uh, Shinzo Abe, the prime minister, is taking Japan in a very, very dangerous direction, milita- militarily and in terms of civil liberties. And it, it's impossible to overstate <laughs> two things. It's impossible to overstate the danger at Fukushima and uh, the danger uh, politically in, in, to what's happening in Japan. And it's no, uh, no coincidence, Gary, that they're happening at the same time. Give us an understanding of the cover-up of the Canadian government on how bad the starfish, uh, salmon returning, uh, wells, uh, there's uh, all forms of purposes and sea lions all dying or getting very sick. And this has been downplayed, but the evidence is there. So from Canada and Alaska and Northern California and Southern California, we're seeing the effects of this radiation even in Hawaii. I have friends who live in Hawaii, and they're telling me that None of the people that they know would eat any of the fish that historically they wouldn't have a problem uh, because of the radiation damage from Fukushima because a lot of these fish can swim thousands of miles. Tell us about the story that we have not been allowed to know the truth on. Well, we're seeing uh, what appears to be, and I I use this term advisedly, an apocalyptic situation in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, We've had a a, a horrific uh, disintegration of starfish. No one's seen anything like this. These starfish are just literally falling apart all along the west coast uh, of Canada and the United States. There's no um, uh, definitive explanation for why that's happening, but it's happening in, in, uh, coincidentally at the same time with disappearance of salmon, of sardines, uh, reports of problems with killer whales, um, uh, the disappearance of pups, sea lion pups along the California coast. Uh, th- this is uh, uh, horrifying. And I will tell you, on my show today, the Solartopia show, uh, Dr. Busby, I asked him what he thought might be the cause of a heightened uh, death rate that's been found by uh, Joe Mangano and Dr. Jeanette Sherman uh, shortly after the Fukushima accident in California. And he attributed it to the likelihood of iodine-131 crossing the ocean, coming to the United States within four or five days, which we know it did, and uh, the iodine, therefore, uh, going to the thyroids and causing certainly uh, an increased death rate and other problems among newborns in in California or or embryos of fetuses in utero uh, in California and the rest of the West Coast shortly thereafter. 
Now, we're getting a great dismissal, of course, from the nuclear industry, from the apologists, uh, from the New York Times, from other, uh, you know, corporate uh, media uh, saying this is not possible, that the doses are too small, it's nonsense. As I'm sure Helen, uh, and, and both Arnie and Helen can tell us, uh, th- these, these things are real. They are happening to us. And I'll give you some historic evidence. First of all, uh, for uh, the past decades, for many decades, Right from the start, the nuclear industry denied that a nuclear reactor could explode, a commercial reactor. When Chernobyl exploded, they said, well, that was a Soviet reactor. It couldn't happen to American reactors. And now, of course, we've had three meltdowns and four explosions in American-designed general electric reactors at Fukushima. Simultaneously, after Three Mile Island, the nuclear industry denied for nine years that rate, that uh, the fuel in the, the core of Three Mile Island Unit 2 had melted. And finally, a robot camera went in there and discovered that, yes, in fact, uh, much of the, radi- of the um, uh, fuel inside Three Mile Island had, ex- had in fact, melted. And th- these kinds of denials continue with the, radi- with the radiological impacts. And uh, thankfully, I've ha- we've had Helen and... And Arnie, to to show us that this stuff is, in fact, related to Fukushima, and it's getting worse. And, and Gary, you know, we are in a really, really serious problem here. We have the government of Japan refusing to even allow the world to know what's going on, let alone have the the, uh, world community come in and help with the situation. Follow-up. Why would our president and those people in the Environmental Protection Agency and the USDA and the FDA, who's responsible for overseeing food that comes in the United States, why would they be saying that there is no problem? Well, let me t- turn this over to Helen in a second, but we remember that uh, Obama, President Obama got in on national television five days after the explosions at Fukushima and said that the radiation would not come to the United States and would harm no, and in any event would harm no one. And this administration has continued to push money, uh, $8.3 billion loan guarantee for two reactors in, in Georgia, um, uh, you know, much, hundreds of millions of dollars now from the Department of Energy to promote new sm- so-called smaller reactors being funded independently by Bill Gates and Paul Allen and Richard um, uh, Branson, who sits on the board of uh, CNN, by the way, which ran a, a pro-nuclear infomercial recently. Um, so these people are all uh, have, are vested in the nuclear industry, and they don't want to see their investments go down. And uh, as John Goffman, the former chief health officer of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, said, that they put their investments before the public health. And, uh, of course, no one is better qualified to talk about that than Helen, who is trying to jump in. So, Helen, uh, proceed, please. Um, yeah, Harvey, I just wanted to say that, yeah, we're, we're seeing these starfish die and, and porcelain whales and salmon and the like, but you can't, you can't extrapolate. You have to measure the radiation levels in the fish that are dying and the salmon and the like to know what's going on. You can't just say, oh, it's probably caused because of Fukushima. As Tim Rousseau said, who's an evolutionary biologist, studying birds and wildlife in the exclusion zones of Fukushima and Chernobyl, we have to have the data. And therefore, it's imperative that scientists start testing the fish to find out what's causing it. I think that the levels would be so low that it's not related to radiation at all, and there must be some virus or something, or there might be a synergistic reaction with radiation and viruses and immune systems. Nobody knows. So we mustn't extrapolate too far from known data, number one. Number two, the Mangano Sherman uh, stuff, um, there were, there is some evidence statistically of babies being born with low thyroid levels. It's called hypothyroidism, possibly because the mothers inhaled radioactive iodine from Fukushima during the accident while our pregnant had went through their percentage into the fetus as thyroid. But there wasn't an increased incidence of, of infant death as far as I know statistically. So we've got to be terribly careful because 
the nuclear industry is very powerful. It's got l loads of money, as you've just said, Harvey. Um, and and they'll shoot us down if any of our data or statistics are not accurate. And let, let me add to that, Helen. Uh, you know, uh, the, the nuclear industry denied vehemently after Three Mile Island that any radiation had come out that, that enough to could, that could harm people. And yet mm -hmm. I went into central Pennsylvania a year after uh, the accident at Three Mile Island, the worst week of my life, and I interviewed people throughout central Pennsylvania. And we also, there were studies done by the uh, local newspaper, the Baltimore News American, of the uh, impacts on animals in the area. And uh, it then came out, uh, which are very clear, uh, both in human terms and in, in terms of what the animals uh, a, a, a happened. And then, and then it came out that, in fact, the nuclear industry did not know and does not know to this day how much radiation came out. And so to get to Gary's point yeah, here... Yeah, that's true, but a, lot, um, yeah, but a lot of radiation came out of TMI. We know that, and there were two-headed cars born and deformed plants and... And, uh, and, Which I saw, and by the an way. increased incidence of cancer. We know that, but the radiation levels in the water at the west coast of America are, are very low, very low. Not the same sort of radiation levels to which plants, animals, and people are exposed to at Three Mile Island, Harvey. Well, what we know also, though, is that there's synergy, and that that um, uh, and there's been no, there's no, there's not no, if if not not much uh, science done on the interaction between even very low ro doses of radiation and other pollutants, and uh, this is a this is something that we're really going to have to deal with as a species because obviously we have seriously polluted the Pacific Ocean, all the oceans, and obviously there have been many other problems relating to other chemicals in the in the uh, uh, in the in the water, and when we add even small doses of radiation, even tiny, barely um, uh, measurable doses of radiation, we have a synergistic effect between those pollutants and the radiation I mean, that's, that's there. That's a theory. That's a theory. You've got to get the data. Okay, it and that, okay, that's what you've got to have the data. And I agree, and that's what we're and hoping will come. And the study had not yet been done, which is what Kim Russo keeps saying. The study had not been done. If you don't do the study, you don't find out. And if you don't find out, then no one's guilty. <laughs> okay, but here is... And, if you don't and want I, to find out, and you're not liable, don't want to be liable, don't do any studies. That's right. what happens. That and I, I would agree with that, Helen. Let's go to Arnie, because Arnie, you have publicly accused the Japanese government of covering up Fukushima's severity. Is there anything you would add to what Harvey and Helen just said regarding the weakness of our own dated nuclear reactors that are most susceptible to a Fukushima-like event? And how long would the cleanup last? Approximately, and, and a couple of months ago, you made a, a public statement that the potential release of radiation from Fukushima could be as high as 15,000 times that of Hiroshima. So put that figure into a context for listeners to fully appreciate its long-term ramifications. Well, the cleanup's going to take decades. Um, you know, after Three Mile Island, um, human beings were inside the containment in a year. And, um, you know, they had uh, put probes into the nuclear reactor within two or three years. Um, and here we are almost three years through, and uh, no one has gone near the containment, let alone near the reactor. Uh, th there's simply no technology on Earth right now to, uh, to get, um, uh, to, to, to decommission those nuclear reactors uh, safely um, and without overexposing a huge fraction of Japan's male population, the um, uh, the overall cleanup and, and the uh, the fact that uh, yeah we've got the release of the equivalent of, of um, hundreds or thousands of, of Hiroshima-sized uh, weapons in the uh, um, in the area, uh, and uh, but um, the prefecture itself the prefecture is like a state, and this prefecture is as big as as um, Connecticut. And they're talking about having to remove six inches of soil over a state the size of Connecticut to clean it up. And I think we can all realize how astronomically uh, expensive and astronomically difficult that problem is. 
it doesn't include the fact that hot spots are are throughout Japan and hot particles are throughout Japan. You know, I've said that somewhere between 100,000 and a million cancers in Japan will result from this, but yet the Abe regime and the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, are saying somewhere between 100 and 1,000. So there's a huge difference here because they're trying to cover up the science behind it. We're contacted at Fairwinds. We're contacted pretty much every week by scientists who uh, in Japan who have had their research stopped or their research thwarted uh, because the government doesn't want to hear it. Here in the U.S., we have American scientists who are desperate to get funding to uh, do the epidemiological work necessary to determine just how bad Fukushima is. And the nuclear industry controls the funding. So um, the legitimate scientific inquiry has been, uh, has been thwarted um, in, in Japan because of threats to career and threats to, to imprison. And here in the United States, maybe more subtly, but the result is the same, uh, they just take away the money from the independent scientists. A point well made. Uh, Helen made a very valid comment, and as did Harvey. And s for the benefit of the audience, Harvey was stating that there has been unusual anomalies with fish and other sea creatures that we've never seen before, and was raising the question, could it be due to the radiation? Helen was saying that it's speculative, it's a hypothesis. And then Harvey responded, yes, but you have to a ask, are these possibly mitigating circumstances? Which means that if you had a lowered, uh, let's say, immune system from low-level radiation, and then you were more susceptible to varying environmental contaminants or viruses, uh, then the synergism of the two together could cause some of what we're seeing. Again, these are hypotheses, and as, as Arne Gunderson just said, uh, and we are not funding the research to find the truth. There was a famous statement by the founder of Gestalt, uh, who said uh, that a fear of knowing is a fear of doing. And I believe he is correct. So our government is not giving the money. The Japanese government is banning anyone from reporting any of these secrets by criminal action. So that, in effect, ends it. And Helen is right. If anyone on the anti-nuclear nuclear critical a uh, watch list makes a statement that cannot be fully documented and fully supported, then immediately you can expect to see the pro-nuclear think tanks come out in droves saying they're just conspiracy theorists, they have no facts on their side, there's no proof. In fact, if anything, we can show you our studies that there's low levels of radiation that couldn't have led to this. So we need to be very conscious of what is said, that we stay within uh, legitimate scientific boundaries, but also we must keep this diligent. They promised us this wouldn't happen. It happened. They said it could not happen. It happened. They now are facing a public that's concerned about opening back up in Operation 50 nuclear power plants in Japan that were turned off. We, on the other hand, because of the people on this panel and others, uh, are getting at least interested in the truth about radiation. Remember, it was Bush and Cheney who were advocating for 400 more nuclear power plants. Obama wanted 400 more nuclear power plants. Then Cheney came back and said, no, he wanted a 1,000 new nuclear power plants and calling it a green initiative. This is the kind of nonsense that goes on, and they control the media, the mass media. Can, Can, I, let me, can I really quickly say, I, I wanna, there's an important point to be made here, which is that uh, John Goffman, former chief uh, health officer of the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, uh, turned around and said that essentially nuclear power is an uncontrolled experiment 
with the entire planet and certainly with the health of the entire planet. And we have to question, why is it the, uh, the responsibility of the anti-nuclear movement and of the people uh, who operate independently without corporate funding to prove uh, the health impacts uh, of, of these accidents, especially, I, I was in Japan in the mid-70s, we warned, people warned that you should, it's not a good idea to build nuclear reactors in earthquake tsunami zones. And we were assured by the Japanese government and by TEPCO that uh, what has happened at Fukushima could never happen. And so, the, you know, now we've had the experiment and we've been proven right, but so what? The damage has been done. Similarly, why is it the burden of the general population without the benefit of corporate funding <clears throat> to prove the health effects of these accidents? These are products which have been introduced into the e ecosphere without any uh, prior testing. You know, when you when you in, introduce pharmaceuticals or or other chemicals uh, into the product stream, generally you're required to prove somehow or other that they're safe. We know how lax that is, of course, and how unenforced it is. But here we've had uh, uh, more than 400 commercial reactors opened within our ecosphere on this planet with the presumption that if something goes wrong, it's the victims who have to prove that there's a health impact. Uh, wh whereas these products have been introduced with no real assurance that they're actually safe. The, the whole thing has been turned on its head, and it, 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 it's literally insane, and it's killing us. And, and I thank you so much for doing this show, Gary, because, you know, that's another point. You are the only one out there doing shows like this in, a, in, a, in what's a, a global crisis. It's astonishing. It, it bothers me as well. This should have been on all the major networks. This story doesn't go away because the cameras are turned off and another crisis has gotten our attention. We're out of time. Arne Gunderson, Helen Collicott, and Harvey Wasserman, thank you all for being with us. We appreciate it.